Welcome to All Bodies on Bikes, the podcast, where all bodies are good bodies, all bikes are good bikes, and all rides should be celebrated. All Bodies on Bikes is a movement to create and foster a size-inclusive bike community. So join your hosts. I'm Maggie. And I'm Marley. As we explore the complexities of the biking world, help us break down barriers and create the world that we want to see. And don't forget that all bodies really means all bodies, not just larger bodies, but bodies of all sizes, ages, races, abilities, genders, sexualities, and beyond. Come along for the ride. Welcome back to the All Bodies on Bikes podcast. We have a really special edition today. Uh, I am sitting in New York City in a hotel room in my pajamas with my guest, which (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I can't say that very often, but I have a uh, very close relationship (laughs) with our guest today, and it's Kaylee Kornhauser, our co-founder of All Bodies on Bikes and our board president. Uh, welcome to the show, Kaylee. Hi, thank you for having me in my pajamas. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for being willing to wake up and record a podcast like right away. Um, so let's set the scene a little bit. What the heck are we doing in New York right now? We are here because we just did the Five Burrows bike tour. Um, and we also had the opportunity to uh, lead a a ride through the city with our wonderful New York chapter of All Bodies on Bikes. So we have had quite the weekend. Quite the weekend. And that was so fun. And let me say for the record, I did not think that a city ride, an All Bodies on Bikes city ride through Manhattan was going to work. Um, When I test rode it, I was like, what are we doing? But it worked. (laughs) It totally worked. And it was like really, really fun. It was. It was really fun. Um, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd do it again. Um, Maybe annually. Maybe annually. (laughs) Maybe maybe annually. But we, we got really lucky. And actually, this happens a lot with the folks that come to our rides is people genuinely care about each other yes and they help us lead it and you know we had one guy on a cargo bike helping cork for us without even asking um we had some folks from cleveland helping out with the the ride leading um it just went remarkably well yeah everybody was so respectful there was an ambulance at one point we were on a narrow road and immediately everybody got over and was quiet and so respectful. It's just like really nice to see because it does, you know, there's three of us leaders out there, but with 25 or so riders, it takes everybody working together. So that was like, that was just wonderful. Yeah. It was like the icing on the cake. And then like, you know, we rode to packet pickup and surprisingly most folks on the ride were also doing the fibro tour. Yes. And so we got our packets and then people were like, well, what now? We want to keep hanging out. Which I feel like is just, like, such a sign for, like, the community that we cultivate. Yeah, Yeah. and then every single person on the group ride rode together on a route that Marley and I did not plan that somebody on the ride took it upon themselves to make a route and then keep the whole group together and every single person went to get lunch together. It was wild. Yeah. Yeah. New York is magical. Also, like, in what other city can you bring 25 people to, like, a random bar in Greenwich Village on a Saturday afternoon and get food and get drinks and have a safe place for bikes and like it was awesome yeah this place just like I don't know New York delivers we're big fans of New York we are I don't want to live here have you guys heard about New York (laughs) (laughs) it's a really cool place you should it's up and coming you should visit sometime (laughs) but honestly though like riding bikes in New York like my first day here my anxiety was really high and then like once you get into the flow of it of like you know, yeah, traffic signals are more of a suggestion and um, there's a lot of <laughs> other people on the roads, but there is like, there's an ebb and a flow to it and it just kind of works. It does. Yeah. You definitely got to be aware, be safe, but it works. Yeah. And it's fun. Well, let's talk about the Five Borough Tour a little bit yeah. before we get too into um, today is actually really cool. We're going to open the curtains to our organization a yes. little bit. Um, we, before I don't want to get too much into it, but All Bodies on Bikes is actually a nonprofit, and the podcast is part of our programming that we do. And so we're going to kind of open the curtains on um, the work that the org is doing and some of our plans for the future and some of the things to look forward to. But before we do that, let's talk about the Five Borough Tour. 
what was your favorite part? Oh my gosh. I mean, riding in that big of a group of people and just like the road is absolutely full. There were 35,000 people and it's like as far as the eye can see, it's packed with people. And then I think my favorite part was when we were below bridges and you could just look up at the bridge and see that the bridge was completely full of other bikers. Yeah, like the Verrazano Bridge. Yeah, like, it's like hard to fathom how many people are on bikes. And I always think like, what if cars didn't exist and bikes just like, this was just like, I mean, it wouldn't be that many people, but this is just like how it was. And yeah. bikes were just like all over. We wouldn't also have these massive roads, but uh, I digress. <laughs> I mean, we would have them. What if cars just went away tomorrow? That I, like that's kind of what it feels like is that cars went away. I loved riding through Central Park. That, that was cool. Was, like, was a highlight. Um, yeah, just so so fun. What was your favorite part? I'm trying to remember where exactly it was at. I think it was after we like we like dipped into the Bronx for a real hot yeah. minute, and then came back into Manhattan, and there was a tunnel. Yes. And when we got into the tunnel, everybody was like hooting, hooting. and hollering, and I just had the biggest smile on my face because it just felt so. I just felt so connected to other people. Yeah, um, I thought the same. Like every time you go through a tunnel on a bike, no matter who you are, you shout or you ding yeah. your bell, which is so funny. <laughs> like we all do that. <laughs> it was just like I don't know. There were people of all stripes and sizes and bike experience, and I, <laughs> I felt a little bad watching people. Like there were some decent climbs. Like I think yeah. over forty miles, we did almost like fifteen hundred feet of climbing. And lots of folks aren't familiar with how to shift gears. Yeah. And it took a lot in me to not be like, shift, 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 make your life easier. But people climbing in the hardest gear. And... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely um, a learning opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> it was those bridges. They're big hills. <laughs> but also just like a good reminder that like, I don't know, this is where the people are at. Yeah. Um, and we've been talking about a little bit and just like so surprised that the industry isn't more involved with these community events like yeah you know i think about like the marathon like the boston marathon or the la marathon and how the big brands are out there representing and they're with the people and this was thirty five thousand people and the only brands we really saw was kryptonite and cleverhood and bivo yeah it was a couple of the rack companies yeah some folks were here but not a lot yeah, yeah. i just think about the opportunity to like get into the the bag beforehand or yeah. to offer neutral support like so many people out here and instead i see the same brands at the same gravel events with the same people over and over again yeah and i just wish we're saturated we're saturated i wish the industry would wake up and come to some of these other events but us too yeah yeah, yeah. so oh you mean us like all bodies on bikes too? yeah like we're yes we're working on it that's why we're here yes exactly <laughs> exactly well let's talk about it a little bit yeah um so do you want to give like a brief rundown of the history of the org yeah okay so um the origin story you know marley and i met um back in 2018 maybe started to give talks um you know we'd both been working independently on size inclusion work but started to give talks together by 2019 in 2020 we started filming all bodies on bikes and which is the name of our film by shimano we didn't necessarily envision like an organization by the same name i think in the film we start and honestly on the ride that we're filming started to like brainstorm what would group rides look like like what if there were group rides across the country like that were size inclusive and felt like a safe place for everybody to come but it wasn't like let's start a nonprofit. like that wasn't like it was not in the cards <laughs> and so you know we both had like full-time jobs we were like you know living our our regular lives um but then when the film came out there was just so much um community support for the idea it felt like it, it almost felt like inevitable, like we had to do some type of organizing around it. And so, I mean, really, this story's a lot yours, Marley, that you left your full time job to make this thing. Happen. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and even at that point, it wasn't intended to be a nonprofit. No, because you and I were both fully aware of the work that comes with a nonprofit. Yeah. Um, and we didn't know if that was the right structure for us. I think I, I mean, I'm happy we took our time to figure that out. Same. 
But after the first Steamboat team, really, which was a few August years ago, 2022. Yeah. Yeah. We had so many folks at that point that were really invested in All Bodies on, on Bikes as an organization, like more than just, oh, you know, I support you, you too. They wanted to be involved. Um, that it made sense to start, you know, I think at that point we might have called it like a leadership team. Mm -hmm. um, and that group met for a long time before we actually you know, went ahead and, and did the work to become a nonprofit, um, which we now have officially been a nonprofit for one year. Yeah. So that is happy exciting. birthday. Happy birthday to us. We went to an anniversary dinner. <laughs> we did. We did. And it was rather unfortunate. It was just like, yeah, the food was, the, the food, company was great. The company was great. The food, <laughs> the food was subpar. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I think about it because like when we first, when we were organizing, um, it became quickly evident that what we were doing is way more than social rights. Yes. You know, we started thinking about the projects and the goals, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. It was like, we need structure. We're going to need some project management. We're going to need some prioritization. We're going to need funding. Yeah. And then it was like, let's make this a nonprofit. Yeah. It just made sense. And so we've been really building this thing for many years, but as a nonprofit for the last year. And so it's exciting that we now have a strategic plan that's out or we have a board, we've got a leadership team, we've got people who know lots of stuff about organizations that Marley and I don't know, like budgeting and <laughs> grant writing, things that are not the parts of uh, our natural skill sets. Um, and so we have like an absolutely wonderful team of people. We've got our chapters. And so, yeah, we're going to talk about that today. I think. Yeah. Well, let's get into it a little bit. So we just released our first strategic plan. And let's talk about the development of that a little bit. And um, listeners, I swear this isn't going to be boring because we got some really fun stuff in there. But if I heard a <laughs> podcaster being like, let's talk about strategic plan, I'd be like, okay, next. Uh, please, please stick around. Um, so Kaylee is like an expert facilitator. And so our board and people that work with us are spread all across the country. So almost all of this was done remotely. And um, you want to walk us through how we got to our priorities and what we're going to talk about here in a minute? Yeah. So we we totally opened everything back up. You know, when we went into our strategic planning, Marley and I had made a, a mission, vision, value statements um, before we became a nonprofit, but we wanted to start from scratch since we had a whole new board. Um, and so what we did is that we, we had these really long strategic planning sessions on Zoom that probably I was the only person who was excited about because my professional job is as a facilitator, mostly doing strategic planning. You made it fun for us. Thank you. I was <laughs> legitimately dreading it. I was like, oh, so many better things I could be doing on this Sunday afternoon. Yeah, it was on the weekend. <laughs> and then it, we got through it and I was like, oh, I'm really excited about this. It was, yeah, it's very like exciting and it fills you, it gives you energy to like be a part of that. So so we started with our mission, vision, values, um, and you know got everybody's input in a in dialogue, and then that became those. And then we went on to our uh, our SWOT analysis. So we, we what is SWOT? SWOT strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats. For those coming from corporate America, that <laughs> probably sounds very familiar. Um, but that's a, a chance for us to look inside and look outside. So look within ourselves and think, what are our strengths and weaknesses as an organization? And then look outside of the organization and say, okay, what are the threats and opportunities for us as an organization? And that is what we did before we set our goals, before we thought about our action planning so that we could really set the tone for what our goals should be, uh, what we need to work on, what we're already doing well, and like what is realistic for us to build over the next few years. Was there anything in that SWOT analysis, and I'll, I'll answer to you, yeah. that stands out to you? Yeah, I was, so, you know, because Marley and I, you and I, Marley and I, we're here anyway, it's all good. <laughs> uh, because Marley we, and me. Marley and me, that's what I always say. <laughs> because we are gravel bikers, that's like our favorite thing. And, be and because a lot of the people that joined the organization came through our gravel team, we've been very gravel focused. And that might also be because that's where cycling is right now, is that it's very gravel focused. But I, for a long time, have been concerned about that focus. And 
I was really pleasantly surprised to hear the rest of the board echo those concerns too. Like I thought I was going to have to kind of push against everybody and be like, what about community events? Like what about road rides, you know, charity rides. And it wasn't like that at all. We were, I was surprised by how on the same page we all were. Yeah. Which was felt really good. Yeah. Same. Um, I was nervous because, you know, we talked about from the very beginning, we didn't want this to be the Marley and Kaylee show. Yeah. And I thought like that was going to come up a whole lot more. I'm really sensitive to feedback Mm. and to perceived criticism. Um, And it did come up, but in a very gentle and loving way. Yeah. Just like, you know, people might recognize me, but not the brand. And so um, I was really just so grateful for our team for the way that it was done. Um, Well, I wonder... If that's you I might see that strength as, and yeah, and I think a it's a weakness. strength. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think most people see it more as a strength. Yeah, than maybe you do. So I guess I'm just yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it makes me nervous. Yeah, it's definitely well. We talked about a couple different kind of threats. Like, okay, we want to be a sustainable organization. It it takes more than just a couple people being, you know, noticed. It, it takes structure. It takes yeah. like all, what does it take to, to keep this thing going and make sure that people continue to feel included in biking events, not just gravel events, you know? So we did, we really, I, I was in, impressed by how able we were to critique ourselves, but also celebrate our successes. Yeah. Yeah. So with SWAT done, then we started getting into the action planning. And this was kind of the fun thing. If you can imagine, <laughs> you know, if we were in person, there would have been a million post-it notes open a wall. And then we would have done like value voting. Yes. Um, but we did it virtually. And do yes. you remember what were some of the things that rose to the top? Yeah. Well, bef- just before we get there, yeah, please. if you don't mind, I'll take a step back because we did one more boring thing before we did the action <laughs> planning. which was, I don't even remember it. It was so did. boring. <laughs> We did our goal setting. Oh, yeah. And so I do want to just say our goals because I think they're really great. Yes. So we ha- we came up with three goals, broad goals. And they were, the first one is to build a joyful cycling community. And so we, our action for that was that we have our local chapters. So like our regional programming, and then we have our national programming. And let's come back to chapters here in yep. a minute because one of the biggest questions we get is chapters. How do I start a chapter? Yeah. Um, why isn't there one in my town? Blah, blah, blah. So hit we'll in that back. and we're going to come back yep. to that. And then our second goal was to create a cultural shift in cycling. And so we do that by working with industry and we also do that by working with our community and making sure that there's uh, resources and support uh, for our community. And then our third goal is to sustain our own efforts. And so this is probably the most boring to everybody, but this is like what, <laughs> something that's very important is that we have our financial stuff in order. So grants, budgets, taxes as an organization. And then we also um, have a goal to do some organizational development. So just things like even how we store our files, yeah. project management. So really like the day-to-day stuff that keeps all of our exciting programming going. So yes. that was our work on all the lead up to the action plan. We did all of that stuff that kind of feels detached from reality. And then we got to our action planning. So I think, Marley, if you want, we can go to chapters now. Yeah, let's talk about <laughs> chapters. So we currently have 13 chapters. Some are more active than others. Um, I'm not going to try and list all of them because I will inevitably miss some. Um, (laughs) But let's talk about growth planning. Yeah. um, Because that's what the people want to hear. Yeah. Um, So why why don't we have 50 chapters? We have been very conservative only in this aspect (laughs) in our... our in our approach to I'd say with risk management we've also been conservative yes we have been conservative around risk and around growth because we really want to make sure that our chapters feel supported uh, that we're leading rides in a safe way we have to consider liability there's all these things that come into play and when we first launched our chapters we actually brought all of the chapter leaders to bentonville arkansas where we had a four-day you know training and team building and we talked safety we talked appropriate ride leadership 
We talked it, a lot about size inclusion. We did. And so we want to make sure that as we grow chapters, we are supporting them just as much as we support the first original chapters and that we're growing in places where they really need chapters and where it makes sense and it's going to be sustainable. So we are planning to grow chapters for those that have been asking um, and we're going to do, take a kind of scaled approach. So this first year of growing chapters, we're just going to start with, you know, three to five new chapters. But then as the years go, we're going to start to add more. So um, I'm looking at our slide on growing our chapters. And so we say that in 2025, we'll shoot to get five new chapters. And then in the next two years, we'll add 10 chapters each year. So you can see like we're starting small, but we'll start to add more and more. And the goal is to have something like 50 chapters yeah. or even more if it calls for it. Like we want to get to that point, but uh, right now we want to make sure that we, we train people, we've got resources available and we're doing this responsibly. Yeah. And I just think about, you know, when we first started this thing, that was one of our biggest hesitations was, um, cause you and I, whenever we would travel somewhere, we would lead a ride, but we didn't let other people. Um, yeah. because I mean, my biggest fear is that some, somebody's going to do a quote unquote, all bodies on bikes ride. And then people are going to get left behind. They're going to be fat shamed just something negative is going to happen. Totally. And then our kind of the promise that we make of being truly inclusive won't be true. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So we, we don't want that to happen. Um, and it's, it's not happening at this point. We have just absolutely wonderful chapter leaders all across the country and we want to keep it that way. Yeah. And what I would say is that, you know, if you're hearing this and like, Oh, I want to start one, send us an email, send us an email at info at allbodiesonbikes.com. Tell us about you. Tell us about the writing scene. Tell us what your plans would be for the chapter. You know, um, it's definitely helpful if you have multiple folks that could lead with yeah. you. Um, because if you try and apply, that sounds bad. If you come to us as a solo person, we're going to say, okay, you're going to need three to four other folks because planning this takes time and effort. Um, and we might be able to help you find those folks, but it's going to be easier if you already have a small community um, who is ready to take this on. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about chapter programming. Um, so we make it pretty easy on our chapters. We ask them to do four events per year. Yep. And those can be four rides. They can be, I mean, obviously rides are the bread and butter of our organization. <laughs> but we know that like Marquette, Michigan, they can't ride for a good part of the year yep. unless they get out fat biking, which I think they did. Um, but, you know, winter is a real thing. So like one of our chapters recently did a, a recycled bike part art night. Um, and so... It can run really run the gamut. Yep. Um, campouts. Um, Denver did like a saddle workshop, saddle mm -hmm. and anatomy workshop. You fix a flat workshops. There's all sorts of things, but really it's about community building. Totally. And we, one thing that we want to make sure we continue to do is that each chapter gets to choose the type of programming that works for their region and their community. So. That's why we just require the four events a year. We don't specify what types of events that they are. Some chapters run a weekly ride. Some stick to the four. It's really whatever your community needs and is asking for. Yeah. And if you're listening to this, I'm like, oh, my God, I had no idea this. all this was happening. Allbodiesonbikes.com slash events. Um, we try and keep them updated there. Um, and you can find out there. Um, unless specified, all of our events are always free. Um, sometimes we'll ask people to help cover the costs. Like if we're going camping and need to pay for a campsite or firewood. But other than that, like yep. free. And we try and specify um, who the ride is intended for. Yeah. 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 And then our other, well, are we ready to move to national I think so. We are, yeah. So our other big area of programming is our national programming. And for years that has looked mostly like our steamboat gravel team which is a huge effort that multiple people put just pour tons of time and resources into for us to bring 10 to 15 gravel riders um, out to Steamboat Colorado, typically for their first gravel event. And we support them uh, in, in a ton of different ways with monthly calls, with lodging, with uh, helmets. kits, helmets, the whole, the whole thing. Um, and then um our other kind of wing of our national programming tends to be involvement at other events around the country. And 
largely that looks like Marley going around the country to different events, like all spring, summer, and fall long, <laughs> on, on a long extended road trip. Um, and fortunately for her and for the organization, lately that's meant more than just Marley. Yes. A small team of people going with um, with expo gear so we have you know a tent and a table and we sit out there at these events and we spread the word about what all bodies on bikes is and how to get involved with chapters we usually lead shakeout rides at gravel events which is like a prep ride um, ahead of the event to make sure that your bike and body are feeling good um, we have sometimes led community rides in the communities where the events are so we do um uh, a decent amount of national programming. Am yeah. I missing any? Um, no, I'm just excited to talk about some of the industry, some of the, the industry facing work we're doing. Cause like yeah. the programming is, is exciting. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that that's where the change is being made. Like no. that's where it's going to sound weird, but like that's where community is being built and we're like winning hearts and minds, Yeah. but that's not getting additional equipment yep. for bigger bodied folks. That's not getting bigger clothing. That's not uh, actually changing the landscape. And so I'm really jazzed up about the industry facing work that we've got going on. Um, yes. And I hope that doesn't sound bad that I'm like not excited about programming. I am excited about programming, but yes. Yeah. Me too. So from day one of Marley and I doing this thing informally together, we have been working with the industry to educate, to talk about product design, to talk about, you know, clothing sizes and bike equipment. Uh, and the industry has been really receptive, even yeah. though, you know, industry is slow moving to make change and not necessarily because the people don't want to make change just because it's, you know, in Marley's past life in shipping logistics, like things take a lot of time. It takes a lot of time and companies have <laughs> strategic plans. They have bottom lines. They have investors. They've got executives. There's just to come in and say, here's a whole new demographic that you need to be working with is challenging. Yeah, but we've been pretty, you know, optimistic successful. and yeah, successful no. in working with industry to make changes, which has been, I, you know, it has to happen. It doesn't matter how great our community is. If we don't have safe equipment and inclusive clothing sizes and, you know, the list goes on, people can't access cycling. And so, yeah, our our goal isn't met if we don't do this work. And so um, we I think we thought a lot about the different ways that we could create this industry facing cultural shift in cycling and, and one that we're working on that's going to take a long time to develop. But we're committed to is um, some type of training and certification for um, retail stores. So bike shops, um, you know, outdoor retailers to get trained in body size inclusion and to get trained in the work of all bodies on bikes, be able to talk the talk, um, have the size, you know, inclusive sizing in their stores, have um, well labeled bike weight limits on their equipment. Um, and then we will in some way certify them. So this is a long ways out from yeah. being an official thing, but it's something that we, are committed to doing. Yeah, one of the things I'm most excited for in the next couple of weeks, um, the National Bicycle Dealers Association. So, you know, think about big brands, people who are actually selling the bikes, all the retailers, they have their annual conference actually in Bentonville and they've invited me to come speak and do two workshops. And so we're gonna really use this as a workshopping opportunity of what does the industry actually need to be able to serve our community better? You know, what questions are they getting? What is the landscape on the ground? Um, and so I'm really, really excited yeah. about that um, because I think a lot of folks come into activism or come into change making and say, we wanna change X, Y, and Z, but it's not a two-way conversation. You know, it's just barging up to the door and saying, give us this, give us that, instead of asking like, what challenges are you having meeting the needs of our community? You know, what would make your life easier and so that will this workshop will help inform both resource guides and the training certification whatever that's going to look like yeah exactly. so i'm like so excited about that and also it just it feels surreal that like you know we set out these goals and last year i was a keynote speaker just like hey here's what we're doing and this year we're actually doing the work um and it feels really cool 
Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. It's a lot of a lot has happened in just one year. Yeah, and I think our last interest we won't we won't bore people with the financial and organizational except details, to say that you can donate to us or if you true. have a grant, we would love to be informed yes. on that. <laughs> yes, that's a good plug. Uh, but I'm a we, good executive director. Yes, you are. We have. Um, <laughs> Our, our last part of the creating a cultural shift in cycling is the community facing part. And it's actually where this podcast fits into our strategic plan. And so uh, the podcast, our website, there are some examples of the community facing resources that we are building out. We also have for a long time now, Marley and I have taught this biking for big people class. We really want to make that class available all the time mm -hmm. to people. Right now, it's kind of just like we just put it on, I don't know, whenever whenever people ask for it. Um, and we want to make sure that the resources are available to our community when they need them, that people can find out, you know, how do I look for a bike? What do I need to be concerned about? How do I find a saddle that feels comfortable? Those types of resources can be available on our website. So those things take time. Um, it take budget. They take people, you know, committed to to making them happen. We are, it's part of our action plan that these things get built out, but um, I wouldn't say, you know, expect to see them next month, but expect to see them, you know, in the coming months. Yeah. Programming can be a little bit sexier and it can tend to take a little bit more precedent. <laughs> um, well, that was a really cool overview of the organization and I hope that was help, helpful to folks and informative to folks. Um, lots of ways to get involved. I mean, the biggest way is just to show your support by wearing a kit, buying a t-shirt, um, buying some, I don't know if you can buy stickers right now. We should probably put some stickers up for sale yeah. on the website um, <laughs> or just make a donation. Um, this is like a community funded thing. One thing we are working on is a membership program. Um, so that would be yes. a really cool way to get involved. Um, but we have some behind the scenes work to do first. <laughs> um, so in wrapping up, um, not entirely, but I want to do what we've been doing the past couple weeks and talk about some events that we've got coming up. Mm -hmm. um, so this episode is going to come out on May 8th. Um, so if you're listening after that, um, apologies, um, but thanks for listening. So we've got some fun events coming up. Our Marquette chapter has their spring kickoff ride um, on Wednesday. Um, so if you're listening that day, that ride is at 6 p.m. Um, mm -hmm. Our Denver and our Seattle chapters are both doing gravel rides. Um on one of them is on saturday may 11th or excuse me they're both on saturday may 11th mm. um, for both denver and seattle um and then really fun one um out of albuquerque um they've teamed up with a store called people and planet refill and they're gonna ride to heidi's ice cream shop fun. so i love ice cream it's an ice cream ride um and then finally marquette again they've got a lot going on on friday may 17th they have a friday morning coffee ride where they're going to meet up at 7 a.m. and go for a ride for coffee um, before getting the work day started. Awesome. Yeah, so people can always keep up to date with our events at allbodiesonbikes.com slash events. We try and keep them updated there. Um, also, we're trying to do a better job about posting things on social media. Um, so, yeah. Kaylee, um, we ask all of our guests two questions. Um, <laughs> have you been asked this before? I don't know. I was on the very first episode. Okay, you probably weren't then. Okay. So um, <laughs> what is something that you wish you got to talk about more besides bikes? Mm. Well, in my day job, I work in natural resource collaboration, specifically helping communities prepare and reduce the risk of wildfire. Um, and I facilitate these multi-jurisdictional groups to um, basically help them adapt to a changing climate okay. and build community resilience. And I don't talk about it that much outside of, you know, the 40 hours a week that I spend working on it. I don't talk about it a lot in my private life, uh, but it's something I'm really passionate about is helping communities um, build their ability to adapt to, to a changing climate by working together. Sweet. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It explains why you're such a good facilitator because it's you. what you do all the time. Thank you so much. Yeah, Marley. I feel really lucky to have you as our board president. I that feel she lucky also to have you. Runs the meetings, which is really nice. Um, one of my anxieties, I don't like running meetings. Um, I didn't even know that. Yeah, I like being in charge. But yeah. I'm always afraid that people are going to think I'm too bossy. 
Oh my gosh. That's so it's so funny because we have we did not like pick each other. Yeah. But we have very compatible skill sets, I think, which is just very fortunate and yeah. probably why this has worked for so long. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. Um, and then our last question for you is what does your ideal day look like outside? Oh man. Mm. Is Honestly, it, it was Saturday. Degrees? Whatever. Oh, whatever Saturday was. Well, yeah, I love a group ride. I love like sixty degrees, and I love a ride that's like moving slow enough that we can see the world around us, mm. and stops at some type of food where we just like share a laugh. And I also really love like like a city ride where somebody has speakers. This might be an unpopular opinion. <laughs> But I love to dance on my bike, so <laughs> I'm a big fan of that. I think I'll go with that, like a city ride with friends and music. That's yeah. not my answer every day, but it's my answer today. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, we had somebody on the ride, the guy on the bullet, um, and his speakers were loud. Yes. It was so fun rolling down the street, seeing people like on the sidewalk, like bopping along or dancing so or just fun. like smiling. Like people on bikes, adults on bikes brings other people so much joy yes kids on bikes brings me joy too that's true yeah same. people on bikes yeah <laughs> well kaylee this has been a great conversation thank you so much um thank you yeah lots more info at allbodiesonbikes.com and we would love your support um and if you're interested again in chapters email us at info at allbodiesonbikes.com thanks for joining us This is an All Bodies on Bikes podcast powered by Feisty Media. The show is produced by Maggie and Marley and edited by the team at Feisty Media. Thanks for listening. Think about everything you take with you on a bike ride. Snacks, tools, a spare tube. It all has to go somewhere and sometimes your jersey pockets just aren't the right choice. That is where Fierce Hazel comes in. Fierce Hazel is designed to help get you outside and they make sustainable bike bags for epic adventures. Fierce Hazel is a woman-led accessory brand who makes eco-friendly bike accessories, including ultralight riding pouches, bike wallets, backpacks, and bike bags. Their products are durable, functional, and uniquely designed so you can worry less and experience more. Fierce Hazel is offering All Bodies on Bikes listeners 20% off. That's right, 20% off. Just use the code ALLBODIES at checkout. Go to fiercehazel.com slash discount slash allbodies for 20% off your purchase. And, you know, honestly, one of the best things about Fierce Hazel is that their products are designed for all types of cyclists, whether you're a recreational rider or a racer or a bike packer or somewhere in between, they've got a product that will definitely meet your needs. All of their accessories are lightweight, durable, and rainproof, and they're made with sustainability at the forefront. So you can expect lots of upcycled products and really well thought out designs. Again, check out Fierce Hazel today and use a special discount code ALLBODIES for 20% off your purchase. Go to fiercehazel.com slash discount slash ALLBODIES for 20% off your purchase. Thanks for being a great supporter of the show, Fierce Hazel. Are you ready to embrace your inner Tifosi? Picture this, you, fully immersed in your passion with clarity and style. That's what Tifosi Optics is all about. Tifosi, derived from the Italian word for superfan, creates eyewear for those who live and breathe their passions. The superfans, if you will. And now they're inviting you to join the ranks. With Tifosi's innovative design, you can live your passion like never before. Their glide technology ensures a snug, bounce-free fit, while the integrated hinge makes them a breeze to wear without snagging your hair. All their glasses are crafted from shatterproof polycarbonate with lenses that are more than just stylish accessories. They're your shield against glare and scratches, offering unparalleled eye protection for whatever adventure throws your way. And for those intense moments when the sweat starts to pour, fear not. Tifosi's hydrophilic rubber nose pads increase grip, ensuring your glasses stay put through every twist and turn. Are you ready to take the plunge? 
head on over to to tifosioptics.com. That's T-I-F-O-S-I optics.com and use the code FM20 for an exclusive 20% off your order. That's tifosioptics.com, code FM20. So don't just watch on the sidelines. Embrace your inner Trifosi and live your passion with Tifosi Optics. (laughs) 